Ramadan Mubarak. With this greeting, I welcome you all to this special edition of Focus on Revere, where today we're going to talk about the holiest of periods in the Muslim religious calendar known as Ramadan. And to guide us through this discussion, I'd like to welcome Malika McDonald Rushdan, who converted from Islam in 1995 and has worked with risk youths in the ROCA program here in Revere, uh, founded the Al Huda Society, a nonprofit organization serving religious and social educational needs of Muslim families in the Boston area, has been a pioneer director of the Somerville Community Corporation, an organization dedicated to building and preserving affordable housing. And if that's not enough, <laughs> Malika is also the director of the ICNA Relief Shelter Network here in the Boston area, in Massachusetts area, where she oversees 10 shelter homes. Um, seating next to Malika is Rashid Mukabir, who is the managing editor, owner of Zara Magazine, a magazine that's devoted to the Arab uh, American community with, within, is it the Boston area or all of Massachusetts? Actually, it's the whole New England area. The whole New England territory. So there you yeah. go, even and bigger our, than that. Yeah. Huh? And uh, our online version is available worldwide. Yeah. So we have a lot of followers from other Arab countries. Uh, well, um, if, if I could say it right, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's my pleasure to have both of you here today and to be finally doing this conversation. It's something that I've wanted to do for, for a long, long time. And, and um, doing some background and research for this, um, I, I found that, that I've only really scratched the surface of Islam, but, but also the similarities between Islam and other religions, the Christian religion, Jewish faith, and so forth. And, and I see that, that we probably have a lot of material for many, many more conversations and discussions going forward. So I kind of look at this as the first. So that being said, uh, let's talk about Ramadan. And um, if I remember right, Ramadan starts the 28th of this month, which is a week from Saturday, I think it is, or Sunday, and lasts for 30 days until the 27th of July. Malika, tell us a little bit about the origin of Ramadan. Where did it start? And well, Ramadan started over 1,400 years ago, um, basically with the revelations of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, the peace and blessings of God be upon him. It is the ninth month of the lunar calendar. Uh, Muslims follow a lunar calendar, so Islam um, comes at different times every year, approximately two weeks earlier each year. So we're actually getting closer to the spring with shorter days, fortunately. <laughs> um, and it is during the month of Ramadan that the first verses of the Quran were revealed to the Prophet Muhammad. So, so. Yeah, and, and I, I read about that in some of my research, but to just go back to, to the month. So you're saying each year it moves up a couple of weeks, so at some point you'll be celebrating Ramadan during winter? Yeah, Would we'll be, be celebrating yeah. Ramadan during okay. winter. Um, I myself have fasted during the winter, and um, at some years it'll actually be close to Christmas as well. So it's wonderful to be able to celebrate and have festivities yeah. during that time of year with our, our Christian um, partners and and as we get on to our discussions and speaking you know Christmas and, and Christian holidays and stuff and, and we'll see that there are a lot of similarities between the cele celebrations uh, during Ramadan and and some of the Christian celebrations at Easter time and Christmas is, mm -hmm. as well particularly at the end well I think there are very um, a lot of similarities among the three main Abrahamic faiths uh, Christianity Judaism and Islam mm -hmm. So, and, and there again is, is some of that uh, subject for discussion at a later point because I really would like to, you know, maybe have some more discussions about it those would be similarities. It wonderful to explore and share. It would be interesting for people to understand and know more about those similarities. Um, <coughs> so, during these 30 days, um, three primary things, um, activities, I, I should say. I did want to clarify please. one thing because we are on a lunar calendar. The tradition is on the uh, night of the, the last day of the month previous to Ramadan, tradition is to actually go out and to spot the new moon or the crescent moon. Um, so we actually cannot tell exact date of when Ramadan may begin. It may begin on the 29th, it could begin on the 28th. It's really of the sighting of the moon. Now in modern times and with science and as it has evolved, there are many that will use scientific calculation to calculate when okay. the new moon yeah, will yeah. begin. So that's how they've chose to pinpoint it down to the exact date, start date, and end date of Ramadan. So you will find two groups, one who will follow the scientific calculation and one who will follow the actual moon sighting. And God knows best which one is right. 
Yeah, and and if I remember right, I think some of what I was reading is that many people in the Muslim uh, faith will 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 look to to get some sort of signal or message from Mecca or somewhere central from from the high priests on on when Ramadan actually starts. Well, actually, Islamically, you're supposed to follow the laws of the land in which you live in. Okay. So it's we have a, um, a moon sighting committee for North America. There you so go. So it's it's, <laughs> it's best to follow the local sighting okay. of where you live. All right. So there there. Uh, so, so getting back to Ramadan and, and the 30 days, um, of course, um, people who are somewhat familiar with it, understanding the fasting, and, and we'll talk a bit about that, but the other activities are prayer mm -hmm. um, and acts of charity. Let's talk about the fasting. You want to tell us a bit about the fasting that takes place during these 30 days? Well, it's, it's funny because when people hear you fast for 30 days, they're like, oh my goodness. Um, but actually, it's fasting from sunup or sunrise mm -hmm. to sundown, um, which during the summer months could be 18 hour long yeah. days that you abstain from uh, food and water. Very hot 18 hour days. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's, it's, it's very, very difficult. Um, but it's also a lesson in, in uh, really learning how to train yourself and, and uh, tame your desires, your desire and your need for food or water. Um, and, but it's also not just the abstaining from food and, and water, it's also abstaining from acts that you should be sustaining, uh, abstaining from all times of the year, but lying and bad talk and bad actions and stealing and violence and those types of things, um, which are, you're supposed to use this time to reflect, reflect on your relationship with your creator, but also reflect on your deeds. Um, and we should be increasing our deeds during this time as well. Yeah, and and again, going back to the similarities, I mean, it, it certainly sounds to me like a lot, you know, growing up Catholic, Lent, mm -hmm. you know, the 40 days of fasting and reflection and, and so forth that goes mm -hmm. on during Lent. So there are a lot of similarities there. Mm -hmm. you know? And I think just as Christians look forward to Lent, I mean, Muslims, uh, every year we look forward, even from a young age, um, young young children start looking forward to, to the celebration and the observance of Ramadan. Mm -hmm. I've been fortunate enough to, to have a neighbor um, who, who is Muslim from, from Morocco, and I've I've had dinner with him during Ramadan after the sun oh, goes down. Oh, I know. That was enjoyable. <laughs> it was very enjoyable. One thing so I like about Moroccan ifta is you get dessert first. <laughs> <laughs> you get the beautiful special cookies that they you know, only make during Ramadan, and you get the, the, the sweets come first before yeah. the meal. So that's the best part of a well, Moroccan iftar. Yeah, and, and then that was another piece uh, of, you know, w when I was reading, you know, looking at some of the, the, the great meals and the preparations and, and, and uh we have some wonderful photos of, of some of the preparations and the meals that take place during that time. Well, the, the community is so diverse. And I mean, myself, I, I, I have coined myself as an international food connoisseur. And, you know, one night I may have Pakistani food, the next Algerian, the next Somali, and just having these festive special foods. I mean, it's, it's one of the things. It shouldn't be our main yeah. focus, but it is one of the things <laughs> that we look forward to. Well, I think if you haven't eaten for 18 hours, you're going to be somewhat <laughs> focused on eating. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How about yourself, Rashid? Uh, do, you know, meals at the end of the day, or I mean, that's something very important, actually. When you are fasting, like for as uh, Sister Malika said, fasting for 18 hours is the first thing you will be looking for after iftar. But here in Revere, we are so blessed. We have like um, a, a pastry shop for for Moroccans, like where you can get like all things that you need, like some sweet stuff. Yep. I, I always go there and get <laughs> take care of myself. I'll be right behind you in line. <laughs> <laughs> and, and of course, the other one of the other major activities taking place during that period of time is is prayer. I mean, as you said, it's a time of reflection. It's a very holy time. Mm -hmm. So prayer is a, is a really big part of it. Um, yes. Uh, talk about the prayers. Um, well, as you know, that Muslims pray five times a day. It's a time that you know people say oh, five times a day, but. It's 10, 15 minutes maximum for the, the prayer. And it's really time to take out, we've been so blessed in this country. Um, you know, we're able to go to work each day. We're, we're able to, you know, break our fast with food on the table. Um, so giving 10 minutes out of your day, five times a day, is not much to thank your creator. And it's also a time for us to, to get grounded and centered. Um, and then during Ramadan, there are special prayers. Uh, now, we also observe the five daily prayers continuously, but during Ramadan, there is a night prayer called Tarawih. And Tarawih prayer is, um, it lasts a little bit longer. You do need to get dedicate some time and have some endurance. 
Uh, but it's during this time that we try to uh, recite the whole um, Quran during the month of Ramadan. So each night a certain portion will be recited. Mm. Um, and so within those 30 days, by the time you reach the end, you will have recited the whole Quran, which is 114 chapters. So from, from the, you start with different chapters at the beginning of the period, and by the end of the period, you will have recited the whole Quran. Yes. It mm -hmm. starts from the beginning. Yeah, from the beginning. Yes, yeah. right from the beginning, Surah Fatiha, which is the opening, which is called the opening. Yeah. And interesting, Surah Fatiha is also recited every day, five times a day. It's the first verse Verses. of the Quran that you recite of your five, when you're doing your five daily prayers. Interesting. Um, and, and, and of course, everybody participates in these prayers, men, women, mm -hmm. children. Tell us a little bit about, because we were talking about in the mosque, when you see the pictures, there's the men praying up front, then there's the women behind. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think at some point there are children in there. But tell us a little bit how that's all organized. Well, I mean, there's a, a lot of misconceptions, <coughs> I think, about women in Islam. Um, and even for myself, I'm faced with it all the time with questions. And I welcome the questions, because I, I love the opportunity to, to really share the truth about Islam. And so that's something that comes up a lot. Well, why are the women behind the men? Um, if you have observed the, the Muslim prayer in the movements, um, we actually go through many different movements during the prayer, but at one point we're down on our hands and knees, um, bent over. So part of the women being behind the men is really for our own modesty. Um, I wouldn't want, if I'm down it's on logical. my hands and knees, <laughs> I wouldn't want a man behind me. And also, I don't think that he would be too focused on his prayer either if he was behind a woman like that. So that's, that, it's logic. It's yeah. perfect logic. And it's not about oppression or anything like that. It's really, because when you're making prayer or salat, your focus is at that time that you're bowing down, you must understand that you're bowing in front of your creator. And that's where your focus should be. How about children? Where, 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 where are children during the prayers? Um, well, some children are running around <laughs> <laughs> while others are praying. And, and we encourage children to start praying at a young age, um, usually by the age of seven. Um, we encourage them to start praying. Um, I have three little girls at home, seven, um, 11, and 12. And the seven-year-old, she is practicing fasting. Uh -huh. So she will oh. fast half days, <laughs> <laughs> while the other two um, do their best to fast the month of Ramadan. And, and you raise a good point. And if I remember reading something, I think fasting generally starts at adolescent age? Yes, yeah. puberty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. And it's, it's believed that puberty is when you start to become accountable for your sins. I uh, personally I started training myself since I was seven, okay. but I started officially when I was 38 years 13. old. So I have been doing it right now for probably like 27 yeah. years. And, so. and people who are of ill health, and, and there are other exceptions oh. to the fasting, yeah? Well, God is merciful. And he doesn't want you to do something that, which is going to be a burden upon you. So if you're sick and you're not able to fast, you have the option to feed a fasting person, which would be you would receive the same reward. So he's merciful upon us that he's not going to place us in an undue burden. Uh, and, and logistically, I was just thinking um, relative to exceptions and stuff. So people who take medication, and sometimes you could take water with pills and so forth, mm -hmm. uh, there's an exception they would be exempt. in that rate. They would okay. be exempt from fasting. And I also wanted to mention, because you know, you're hearing me say God, mm -hmm. and in Arabic we say Allah. Mm -hmm which is very similar to in Spanish when they say, I think it's dois, di uh, dios, dios. dios. Yep. Um, Allah is just an Arabic word for God. Yep. And there's only one God and the same God of the Christians and the Jews. It's worth bringing up and, and, and thank you very much for that because you're right. Um, uh, you know, there were, there were so many words for God. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jehovah, Joshua. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but oftentimes yes. when they hear Allah, they think it's foreign God, yeah. that it's some, something different. It my my so native God. language is English, so I say God. Yeah. But, you know, I still have an understanding yeah. of who he is. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, the, the prophets that came before that he sent as messengers unto all of mankind, starting from Adam and Moses and Jesus. And, yes, Muslims believe in Jesus, and yes. he is one of our prophets. Um, and Jesus is written. Uh, there, there are accounts of Jesus and his life written in the Quran, yes. as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, the, there are some of these misconceptions, and, you know, I'm hoping people will learn more to see that we do share so many similarities. And this is, you're taking a wonderful step right uh, here. And, and that's, that, that's kind of why I'm doing this, is, is to point out, 
out those similarities, I think, in, 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 in many of the faiths that exist. And not just Muslim faith, but you know, there's Muslim, Christian, as I said, Jewish. There are a lot of similarities between them. Mm -hmm. And we'll have more discussions about those, I think, going forward. So getting back to the 30 days again, um, the other major activity that takes pl place during those 30 days is acts of charity. Yes. Talk a little mm -hmm. bit about those. <coughs> well, the whole purpose, um, you know, of fasting is, first and foremost, is disciplining oneself. Um, you know, using restraint and disciplining oneself. But also, if you're fasting 18 hours a day, can you imagine the hunger pains that you might feel? You know, the thirst, especially in the summertime. We need to be mindful of others that at the end of the day, we're fortunate, we're blessed that we have these elaborate meals to break our fast with. But there are others in, in the world, and even right here in our own backyards, who have very little. So this time is we're so also also supposed to be mindful of those who don't have as much and are less fortunate, and part of that is charitable giving or alms giving, um, which is called zakat al futur in Arabic, mm -hmm. alms giving, and there is a tax which is placed on every uh, Muslim who has a certain amount of um, and I can't I don't know the exact figures who has a certain amount of savings um, that each year there's a tax on that that they're to give that in charity. And that is to be given before the last day of Ramadan because that charitable giving is so that others who are less fortunate in the community can also celebrate the last day of Ramadan and the Eid al Futur, the, mm -hmm. the breaking of the fast. Um, so you will see increased acts of charitable giving during Ramadan. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't spill over too, too far after Ramadan, as it should. Yeah. <laughs> it's like um, we say people should experience and, mm -hmm. and should practice Christmas all year long. It doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, organizations such as my, the organization that I work for, uh, ICNA Relief, I'm the director of the Massachusetts Field Office, this is one of the, the things that we do. We orchestrate the giving of Zakat al Futur at the end of Ramadan, where we ensure that those that are in need in the community receive a certain amount, and it's split based on family size um, so that they too can enjoy and, and receive what is due to them. Mm -hmm. um, if Islam was practiced as it's supposed to be, and as any religion, it's not always practiced as it should be, but if Islam was practiced as it's supposed to be, we would see less, more po less poverty in our mm -hmm. communities. There would be those that were less in need yeah. if everyone was giving, um, you know, their, their zakat al-futur. And like I said, that carries over to the other religious faiths mm -hmm. as well, in the world in general, mm -hmm. if it was practiced more. Um, you, you yourself experienced an act of charity. I think you were actually on a hajj, if you will, to Mecca. The minor hajj. The so minor hajj. Umrah. So, so Umrah. Talk, talk about that. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I was fortunate enough to be able to go to Mecca in Saudi Arabia and also to visit Medina, um, which is another city where the Prophet Muhammad's mosque is. And it is a uh, hajj itself is a, a pillar of Islam that every Muslim that has the financial ability to do so should do this, um, and they're obligated to once in their lifetime, at least once. Um, but once you've gone, you always want to go back. Uh, but while I was there, it was just amazing to me. I mean, among thousands and thousands of people at the Kaaba, the Kaaba is the first mosque. Actually, we believe that Abraham first built the Kaaba as well. The prophet Abraham, um, or Ibrahim in um, Arabic, first built the Kaaba. It is the black box that you see in the middle of the, the mosque. And you will see so many people gathered there circling the, the Kaaba and there are people from all over the world and it's a beautiful sight because you'll see if during the Umrah or at different times during the prayers you'll see people in different cultural attire and, and so forth but when you're making the pilgrimage or you're on Umrah all men will wear two, piece, two pieces of unsewn cloth and this is so there's no distinguish you cannot distinguish between someone who may be rich or someone who may be poor because we are all one in sight of God. God will judge us based on our deeds, not our wealth. And, you know, oftentimes if you see those that are poor are the ones who give the most. So it's yeah, just, it was a beautiful true. sight. And so after I was done circling the Kaaba, I had sat down for a little while and my feet were, were swollen and, and <laughs> hurt. And this older woman who didn't speak English, I believe she might have been from Bangladesh, she came over and she sat on the floor in front of me. And she, she motioned to me, you know, like this. And I was like, oh, no, no, no. You know, my feet, you know, hurt her. She picked up my foot and started to give me a foot massage. I mean, just 
There you go. The pure <laughs> generosity. I, mean, I, I, I started yeah. crying. Yeah. I think I cried probably the whole entire time I was there. <laughs> but and, and you were talking about, you know, the, the, the Hajj, going to the mosque, and, and I think we're all familiar with the Grand Mosque in Mecca, mm -hmm. those pictures that we see of, it looks like hundreds of thousands hundreds of people. Hundreds of thousands, oh yes. Thank you. I mean, it's just a sea of humanity, and it's just an incredible sight to see. Um, number one, that mosque is, is, is quite, quite a, an incredible building in itself. Well, Islamic architecture <coughs> is beautiful. Yeah. Um, and then the Kaaba in the center, and then you've got that, as you said, mm -hmm. sea of humanity um, circling. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about why are they doing that. And more importantly, if you start from the outside, how long does it take <laughs> you to get to that point where you can actually touch the Kaaba? It takes quite a while. <laughs> you kind of have to jump in and go with the flow, and yeah. it's about 20 circles before you're actually able to touch the, the, the Kaaba. There are, are rites and rituals that every Muslim must follow when they go to make the Umrah or, or the Hajj. Um, the Umrah is a smaller um, Hajj, so to say, or pilgrimage. Um, so you're not doing all of the, the rituals during the Umrah. Um, maybe you can answer better than I why we circle the Kaaba seven times. Sometimes you just do what you're told. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I'm sorry. It is written. I, it is uh, as it is written. And I mean, just as I mean, we we know that there is air that we breathe that we can't see it. You know, there are things within all religions that if we're practicing and we believe, then we follow. Yep. Exactly. You know, if you're there and you're experiencing it, when I was first put in front of the Kaaba. It was like an out-of-body experience almost. It was like I couldn't, I, I, I was astonished. It was like I was floating in the air that I was actually standing in front of God's house. And this is the direction that Muslims pray five times a day. We, we face Mecca during our prayers. So to actually finally be there and to, to be a part of humanity that, that came to worship as one, is there's no other experience in, in the world. Um, and the peace that I felt there. I was telling people when I came back, I could have slept like two or three hours a day and woke up feeling like I had slept a full eight hours. It was just, you just felt, I've never slept. You sleep like a baby. You sleep like a newborn baby. There's just such a sense of peace there. And, and I guess, trying to, again, to, to try and draw similarities, I, I, and I think of that, you know, touching the Kaaba to, similar to the Wailing Wall. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. the experience that people have when they actually visit and touch the Wailing Wall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's an emotional, spiritual journey. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't done it yet, but I will be doing it as soon as I can. Yeah. But my parents did it, and they, they, they always talk about it as an amazing experience, and they want to do it again and again. So. Now, now, I understand there are, there are, of course, mosques all over the world, John, like, just like there are churches all over the world, and there mm -hmm. are a number of grand mosques. But when people talk about doing the pilgrimage, is it always to Mecca, or always. are there other places? Always, always, to, always Mecca. to Mecca. Okay. It used to be at a different location, <coughs> and that has since changed, mm -hmm. but it's always to Mecca. Yeah. Now, um, now, again, so we, we talked about the fasting, we talked about the prayers, we talked about the acts of charity, um, and, and then, you know, the, the pilgrimage to, to the mosque. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about is, is, is some of the festivities. Again, it's a time of reflection. It's a time of prayer, fasting. So you're thinking, oh, this is a very difficult time. But it's not. It's a time of celebration as well. Talk mm -hmm. about the celebrations, the lights. And we already talked a little bit about the food. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, mean, I, think it's, I think the celebrations are very different here in America. Um, and as a convert to Islam, I've tried to start my own traditions for my children. And so we do hang lights in the house. and. We find decorations that might be suitable. We go to the party store and get cut out stars and moons. And we, we make our own Ramadan decorations in the home. But the last day of Ramadan is um, a special celebration. It's when we can finally start eating again during the day. And the community comes together for a special prayer, which is called the Eid prayer. Um, and after that, there are many festivities. You'll find mosques that will have carnivals out in the parking lot with the bouncy houses and face painting and henna and the, the food. I mean, it's just you'll find banquets of, you know, all these different delicious sweets and special foods that come from all different cultures. And it's usually a day of celebration. I, in, in the U.S., it's more difficult because we have our regular work schedules. In other countries, it's a three-day celebration where there are lights in the streets and festivities that go on for three days. It's, and then in other parts of the, the world, um, I, I was fortunate to be able to visit the Emirates at one time. 
And what I found that was most amazing, which is going back to the acts of charity, is that they would put out Ramadan tents outside their homes where they would put foods in, food in that anybody who may be in need could just come and take. You know, so it's, it's a festive time. It's acts of charity. It's thinking about your brothers and sisters, whether they're Muslim or not you know, of making sure that all of those that are in need are taken care of. Mm. So how can I celebrate if I know that there are others in my community who are not celebrating? You know, if I'm fasting and there are others in my community that I know about and I'm not thinking of them, then my fast is not valid. Mm -hmm. My fast is void. Um, So come the Eid and the festivities, I mean, the children look forward to it. There's Eidy gifts. They they look forward to getting their gifts. we do a, a gift exchange at my house every year where the kids get, you know, new clothes or new dresses. And, you know, especially the Eid prayer, everyone comes out in their finest. It's like the, the Sunday best, you know. <laughs> Everybody, Easter Sunday. Easter works. Sunday, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah you know? <laughs> Instead of the hats, we have our beautiful scarves. Nice. And, you know, they come out dressed to impress. I mean, it's like a fashion show. Yeah. <laughs> it's beautiful clothes. You'll have clothes from West Africa, South Africa, North Africa, the, the, the Arab world, Indonesia, Malaysia. It's, it's just amazing. Yeah. You know, I mean, though there is no one style of clothing for a Muslim, um, and, you know, as I mentioned, my scarf, you know, Muslim women, we are encouraged to dress modestly, but that doesn't mean that we have to be dressed in an, um, you know, an all-black burqa. <laughs> you know, um, there are requirements of hijab, which means that everything should be covered except for your face and your hands. There's a s- dispute on the feet, but I don't think too many people are attracted to feet. Um, and then just modest clothing. Mod- you know, clothing that doesn't show the shape of your body or your figure. You know, and it shouldn't be see-through, um, unlike Rihanna's la- latest dress that she had. Um, <laughs> you know, it's more to preserve our modesty. And I think, you know, I, I, I'd like to mention, too, that when I started wearing the hijab is when I truly found my dignity. You know, it, it, it pushed me to, to new heights and, and um, really made me have to start using my intellect, my intelligence, rather than, you know, showing off, you know, my beauty. It really forced me to develop myself as a human. Well, it, it, it's not, un- and I guess they, they began trying to draw similarities and, and likenesses. This is not unlike the whole discussion about uniforms for, for children in school so that they're not concentrating on having the best genes in the world or mm-hmm. whatever. You know, it's just everybody's wearing the same thing yeah. and everybody's concentrating on learning. On their so learning, exactly. Case, very, very good analogy. Very good. And, and coincidentally, too, I'd like to mention, I'm not married to an Arab. My husband's American. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I was, spe- I was speechless in front of Malika. I'm so, I'm so blessed to be <laughs> sitting next to her. <laughs> she did all the talking. Yeah. And well, it's well, amazing. It's amazing. Well, just well, one more thing to please. add, like, about Ramadan. It's completely different from back home. That's what I was just as going to ask because yeah, you told me earlier yeah, about yeah, the, as the as difference. As yeah, as an Arab American who immigrated to the United States, like I have been here like 10 years, it's uh, the 10 years that I've been doing Ramadan here in the United States, it's completely different from back home. Uh, uh, w- uh, what I mean, it's like when you are in uh, a Muslim country, yeah, Everybody is doing Ramadan, so when you look tired, everybody understands that you are tired because of Ramadan. Yeah. But when you are here, yeah. doing your eight-hour shift, your manager expects you to be working, <laughs> <laughs> doesn't expect you to be praying. or uh, So it's completely different. And they remember like when I was ra- working in a restaurant and... Uh, the time when you want to break your fast, it always gets busy around <laughs> that time. <laughs> and you see everybody eating, and you have been like fasting for 18 hours. It's completely different from I, yeah, I back imagine. home. Yeah, if you're Muslim yeah. and you're a waiter, 8 yeah. o'clock at night, it's pretty busy in a restaurant. Exactly. You're seeing all this beautiful food coming out, mm-hmm. and you can't have any of it yet. <laughs> so if I, could, if I could throw a little controversy in here, but Ramadan in America is a great jihad. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Explain it because I'm, I'm people hear the word jihad all yeah, the time, yes. and they hear it misused the majority of the time. Jihad is a personal struggle. It is a struggle to fast here in America. People look at it as jihad as a holy war. I yes, think is most, yes. most people the, the translate true, it to. The true translation of jihad is a struggle. A struggle. So fasting in America, most Arab countries or in the southeast, um, south, you know, South Asian countries, people are able to, you know, at one o'clock, the shops close down, people take a nap, you know, you, you get to rest. Here in America, life goes on, we have to keep working and working and working. It's a jihad. 
jihad is a struggle. Interesting. And it's a personal struggle to be able to fast. Well, that's, that's, that's great because, you know, that, that puts a whole other, you know, use of the word, you know. That, 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 that well, that and that's how it's intended it. to be used. Yeah. Yeah, it's exactly. not how it's <laughs> been coined yeah. um, in, in mainstream media. Yeah. Um, so, so we've talked about the, the festivities um, and, and the celebration at the end, um, <coughs> and we, we talked about the lights. I, I guess one of the things relative to the whole celebration, again, doing a little research, I was um, tons of, um, uh, if you will, um, uh, Ramadan cards. It's mm -hmm. almost like Christmas cards, you know. Like yes, it's, be <laughs> it's it, becoming it, well, a, a marketing. The commercial part yeah, of it. Commercial. Talk about the, commerci the commercialization of Ramadan. Yeah. yeah um, you know, uh, they're, they're starting to market to Muslims in America, um, and with that is, is becoming some of the commercialization. Yeah. And I think it's unfortunate, I mean, personally. I mean, it's nice that they're catering to us, yes. But as we stated, you know, Ramadan, that's not what Ramadan is for. Ramadan is to be thinking about those that are less fortunate. So if you're out buying, you know, Ramadan cards and, you know, all these Ramadan decorations now that they're... they're I think the homemade cards or the homemade decorations, those those are the most special ones yeah. because what I could be sp what I'm spending on lights and decorations and things like that, which I do, I could be giving that to to charity. Um, the commercialization of Ramadan, you know, it, it's plus and minuses. It's plus and minuses. I mean, I think it's wonderful that the the American, you know. Um, retailers are, are marketing to us. They've taken a lot of slack. I mean, I know in years, I think it was Kmart or, or Walmart that put like Eid Mubarak in one of their circulars yeah. and they received a lot of slack over that. Um, but I think things are getting better. And I think things, in, especially in New England and Massachusetts, we're different. We're different than the rest of the country. Um, you know, I think, you know, Muslims in, in Massachusetts really have been welcomed and embraced and, and people in, we're free thinkers. You know, and that's what led me to Islam, was I'm a free thinker. Um, and I think, you know, most people in Massachusetts, because we have many of the best universities in the world are right here in our own backyards. You know, we have many college-educated people here. And we question things. And I think, you know, American Muslims in Massachusetts are, have been embraced. And the community, the non-Muslim community, is eager to learn is eager to learn. They don't necessarily believe everything that they hear about Muslims. Mm -hmm. So I think we're at a pretty good position here in, in Massachusetts. I, I know it's not the same in, in many parts of the, the country, but you know, New England is different. And so you, I think you will see more of the retailers and so forth because as the, the Muslim community grows in America, we spend money. Yeah. So they want to capitalize well, off of that. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so it's I, I would imagine so. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're getting close to our, our, our ending time, but I did want to mention, and we were talking about Ramadan dinner and, mm -hmm. and uh, what a great experience it is. And you mentioned that there is uh, a mosque nearby. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have um, to get I my dates. I believe that, that we'll mm -hmm. have, mm -hmm. um, and this is for Muslims and non-Muslims. Well, actually, this specific, Please. this specific night and breaking of the fast, which is okay. July 8th, uh, it's a Wednesday, July 8th. The Islamic Society of Boston Cultural Center, which is the largest mosque in New England, will be holding a iftar for non-Muslims, where we're welcoming, welcoming our neighbors to come in and break fast with us. So that's July 8th at sunset. It's easy to, to remember the time. <laughs> sunset, July 8th. Feel free to come a little bit um, beforehand to observe the night prayer. And, and where is that? Where is it located? It's at 100 Malcolm X Boulevard. Um, in Boston, it's at Roxbury Crossing is the closest train station, which is right across the street from the, the mosque. Mm -hmm. um, and you can't miss the mosque because it has the traditional Islamic architecture with mm -hmm. the dome and the tall minaret. Um, so again, it's July 8th at sunset at the Islamic Society of Boston Cultural mm -hmm. Center, 100 Malcolm X Boulevard. Okay. And then there's also a mosque which is very close to you, which does a lot of community um, events and celebrations. They work very well with the city of Chelsea, which is the Al Huda Society. You mentioned mm -hmm. in the beginning, um, I just wanted to clarify, I'm yep. a co-founder, not a co founder, okay. co-founder of Al Huda Society, which is at 60 Willow Street in Chelsea, which is right across the street from the Boys and Girls Club. And um, definitely come down on the Eid day where they'll be having their carnival. They have yeah. an Eid carnival every day, coincidentally, inside the Boys and Girls Club. 
Um, they allow them the space there. And they've done a lot of community service, like community cleanups when Chelsea does that and organizes that. Um, so their doors are always open um, to anyone who wants to come in and learn more. Sure. And Just Rashid, I talked about your magazine earlier. Or I mentioned it in, in your introduction. Tell us a little bit about the magazine before Abs we go. Absolutely. Uh, this is called Zara Magazine, and this is the only Arab-English uh, magazine in the whole New England area and uh, for the people who would like to learn a uh, little bit about Ramadan we did have in our June release uh, an article called an American perspective of Ramadan it's written by the respected professor Richard Booth and uh, also expect our July release and it will be more articles about Ramadan okay. if you want to learn about it and it is a free magazine how it do people is. get it uh, people can uh, get can do subscriptions. We can send them to their houses, and also you will find them in some uh, busy locations, uh, such as halal stores, and also we do have them in universities, dentist offices, hospitals, uh, hotels. The delicious Casablanca Bakery on Shirley Ave. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it will be there. I've actually Definitely. had some of the desserts from Casablanca <laughs> with my friend from Morocco. Uh, so. I like uh, the Oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Uh, just uh, to uh, go back to the magazine, it has like an Arabic side. So don't be surprised when you pick it up. It's not all in Arabic. It has another side, which is an American yeah. side. This side, half it's in English, and the other half it's in Arabic. Arabic. So. Mm -hmm. And you were going to say, Malika. Well, I also wanted to mention, in the spirit of Ramadan, my organization, Ikna Relief um, USA, we're doing a Ramadan food drive. Um, and we partner all the time with different um, organizations and schools. And so um, if your viewers would like to contribute to that, um, we can be found at www.icnarelief.org. Yep. And that gives you all the information about our local field offices. My information is on there as well. Um, and we hope that people would contribute to, we have an emergency food pantry at the Islamic Society of Boston Cultural Center where my office is located, um, that people can donate various items that, you know, from beans to rice, non-perishable food items that all people might be in need of. And we serve Muslims and non-Muslims, so anyone that's in need can access our food pantry. Wonderful. Well, that wraps it up for uh, this session of Focus on Revere. And it's been a very enlightening session, as, I, as I'd hoped it would be. It, it's been every bit as, as what I expected it to be. And like I said, I look forward to hopefully having some more conversations uh, about the, the, the Muslim faith and, 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 and religions in general is, is, is so forth. Um, to take us out of this session, um, I actually, during my research, found a song by a gentleman. His name uh, Mahir. Zain, 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 mm -hmm. um, who is a Muslim from Switzerland, if I remember correctly, um, who did a song about Ramadan, and I thought it was really appropriate to kind of take us out. So, um, is it appropriate to, in saying farewell, to say assalamu alaikum? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, which means may the peace and blessings of God uh, be upon you. There you go. Um, so, assalamu alaikum, and um, uh, was it uh, Mubarak? Uh, I'm sorry. Ramadan Mubarak. Mm, Ramadan Mubarak. <laughs> Happy Ramadan. I'm still Happy learning. Ramadan. <laughs> Happy Ramadan to everybody. Take care until we talk again the next time. Bye.
ليتك دوما قريب In 